Right, um, welcome um, everybody um, to this um, session of the PG Whip. Um, today we are welcoming Abby Eleanor Fouvenon. Um, Abby completed her um, bachelor's degree in Classe Preparatoire um, at the University of Montpellier and has since then completed a number of master's programs in um, areas ranging from history of art, archaeology, classics and French um, at the universities of NCU and um, Lyon, um, most recently completing a master's degree in classics with uh, classics and pedagogy with French. And um, today um, she is going to speak to us about um, Demosthenes's additions during the Renaissance. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I chose this topic because I thought that human is um, could write and speak perfect Latin and perfect Greek, uh, but that was not the case at all. Big disappointment for me. <laughs> so, as I had worked on Caesar uh, and rhetoric before, I just picked Demosthenes for Greek. Due to the limits of time, I will not speak about illustrations. I will not speak either on uh, how students would use the Demosthenes books. Um, I will not speak about introductory notes um, before this text. Um, but you've got my email there, so if you need references or a quote from an author or something about a specific country, just email me and get in touch. So let's start with education, antiquity, and um, how it affected the way to see and to use Greek. We do have curricula about this period of time, and it seems that it can be divided into two conceptions of ancient times. One saying that knowledge is dangerous, and that the other one that one can absorb ancient knowledge and um, in order to include it to build a new ideal humanist. So why would you use, um, would you study ancient times during the Renaissance um, and language? Because it seems obvious nowadays that you would uh, kind of study philology, but it was not at this time. That was not a requirement. The Italian Leon Battista Alberti gives us a hint in one of his letters. He explained that um, being able to speak in a clear way shows a kind of rational mind thereby mastering language is important for him. But he also says that reading ancient authors is a pleasant activity, it's, refreshed, it's sorry, refreshing, it can help you relax. It helps you improve your rhetoric, and the more you know how to use it, the more you can be pertinent in your remarks. So it allows you both to convince and to persuade, people and if you can persuade people you can be listened to so it's a political asset for him because you can then be loved by the people. Now the curriculum there was no specific teaching during the Renaissance except for the trivium and quadrivium that is to say grammar, logic, rhetoric, so three subjects and then arithmetic, geometry, music and astronomy. Both used um, ancient texts, even when dealing with sciences, just because ancient texts were references, even for architectures. architecture. Sorry. Uh, but the selection of texts you would use was entirely at the discretion of the teacher, so you could kind of read um, Demosthenes when you were working in Italy, but never Demosthenes in Germany. But Hall had a kind of progressive way of assembling these texts. For instance, we've got Vittorino, who conceives learning as a way to strengthen your knowledge. <clears throat> so here um, we have his curriculum, and he says that you would start with grammar um, via two poets, Virgil and Homer, um, so the Roman and the Greek, and then two orators, that would be Cicero and Demosthenes. Then you would move on to dialectics and rhetoric to develop your critical mind. And these subjects were a kind of basis to think about all the sciences. And so after that, you could study mathematics, arithmetics, geometry, astronomy, and music. And last but not least, um, you could read about philosophy. And Vittorino also coupled it with um, physical education. We have many examples, and each of them are different, but the core of it is that education tries to give students a sort of ideal level of education um, 
um, of learners and wise men. This way of life is provided by the extensive use of classics and the analysis of philosophy. Moral is, indeed, one of the most favorite topics for humanists. Modern life has to be seen through the lens of ancient authors who explain example with Tutsis, uh, before eyes. And this demonstrates that education is perceived as a tool to reach an adequate civil behavior adapted to political life. Now, I told you that knowledge was not well judged all the time, and it's one of the reasons why many preferred Latin to Greek. The reason is that curiosity is strongly criticized, or as Erasmus wrote it, it is one thing to be learned, it is another to be wise. The problem of curiosity is that it's um, never ending. In some texts, there is even a form of violent attack against reason and reasoning as a kind of obstacle, um, denying the love of God and even salvation. So <clears throat> that is why in many humanist texts, there is a clear skepticism. Skepticism, sorry. Humanists were doubting, and research is all the time theoretical. So if one studies, it is to get closer to God. Paradoxically, they become aware of their own limits in the gap between their finitude and God. So the desire to know the limit of candy is not problematic because they take you away from God, but because they give the type of glory you could find in Achilles or Ulysses in ancient texts. So they're guilty of amartya and hubris, of the kind of fault of excessiveness that you find in ancient Greece. Similarly, some humanists even state that one must know nothing. No, you must know nothing. <laughs> one must know everything, for clearly faith lays in the um, message that you don't understand of God. And it is something advocated in the Bible. This critique of Libidus Kiendi obviously had an impact on Greek. Guillaume Goudet, the French humanist, proves it. He has an explanation about Greek revival. So, according to him, there are two Renaissance cities. The first one is due to Christianism and Evangelism, and the second one um, is a pagan one with Hellenism, classics and pagan values. So, first philosophy of Christian, and then the other way around with a reading of language and Greek literature. This makes William Bedell stand from assumes that eventually the revival of Greek learning and Greek ideals at the Renaissance changed this sphere of curiositas into a narration and elation. The scholars tend to think that this um, rejection of classics, depending only on the form of it, like rhetoric as a bad and then exercise. <coughs> but when you look at examples in humanist writing, for me, it depends on an ancient cultural background. Culture as never-ending effort, uh, methodology, skepticism, even pejorative examples described by Jung Budil are stemming from ancient writing. So there are things um, already evident by artists and philosophers during ancient times. It's not something new. Um, now I will kind of deal with an overview of printing, roughly speaking, obviously. <coughs> So printing has been made possible thanks to technical progress advances such as um, alloys for type settings or printing paper, as it means um, it's half of the cost of a book. Um, people sometimes fear this en masse reproduction because some printers printed 40 editions or cheap ones. Um, however, many printers at the time were also erudite person, and that's obvious when you see annotated versions of the Bible. That was a problem for the church and the university as well. For example, we've got an example in France. Uh, La Sorbonne attacked the French printer because they considered that he was only a technician. And so he didn't have anything to say um, about the Bible, uh, contrary to a theologian, for instance. Also, when you read his book about censorship, it says that he made uh, knowledge too much accessible, so the church didn't like it at all. Technically speaking, type settings and fonts are important elements to understand how Greek progressed. So humanists love to have practical but eye candy books. And so printers slowly adapted. Little by little, they used various and distinctive fonts adapted to the type of text, so theology, literature, um, fable, etc., etc. That was rather easy for the Latin alphabet, but hard when it comes to Hebrew, uh, to Greek, or to Arabic. 
especially because Greek has many accents, so uh, it was time consuming, it was demanding, and it was very expensive. The Reformation as well too, um, as well played a part in Greek spreading, um, and it has been a catastrophe actually, because printing a lot to distribute papers, um, pamphlets, um, ideas, so that was dangerous for the power. In France, I don't speak about England because the system of um, printing is different here. But in France, many printers who were interested in Greek were also Protestants. Um, and many printers had to leave the country, so um, at the best their books were burnt, or at the worst they were burnt with the books. <laughs> in 1535, we have a number of um, closed um, printer bookshops, so it ended up, we ended up with only kind of 12 authorized printers, that, that's plain. And that's one of the reasons why you then uh, had the privilege, what called the privilege, and what is called in England um, the copyright. Now I move, I move on to Greek and its use. Mm -hmm. So there was a dichotomy between Latin and Greek. Latin was widely used just because teachers and pupils could communicate and because it was easy to read. Um, commentaries were written in Latin, and as an example, students in Florence wouldn't have the same language as they would come from Germany, from France, from Italy, so that was easy for them to communicate in this language. Um, besides, Latin had a clear grammatical structure, contrary to other new vernacular languages, which is not obvious nowadays, but as they were kind of creating them at the time, that was uh, more useful for them to use Latin. Because, as I said before, Greek printers had um, been condemned by the church, so it did not help. And moreover, the vast majority of texts are literary, and the religious tradition exclude them from the purpose. So um, they refuse to study anything else than philosophy. Especially um, because that's mixed. Especially when it shows a different belief um, with multiple gods, and many Greek texts have also been destroyed during the second, the fourth crusade. Sorry. So now I'll move on to Greek and university. Um, at the very beginning of the 16th century, specific teaching with um, three languages. So that also that always means Latin, uh, Greek, and Hebrew, the language used in the Bible. Uh, so they were created in Lewin, Paris, Oxford, uh, Oxford in, in 1520, and definitely settled Greek because it meant no real distinction between the religi religious Greek texts and uh, non-believers ones that were not accepted before. We have the example of the criminal in Italy created to teach Greek texts to emigrated Greek fleeing the Turks. Um, and teaching has been made according to a Byzantine curriculum because it had a clear structure. The Byzantine administration relied on eloquence, they formed teachers, and good writing was necessary to enter it. So that was made possible through imitation, and of course it had been reshaped for Yoruba and origins, because the Greek Byzantine grammar, for instance, is composed of seven, 76, no, 56 declensions and 13 conjugations, so mm. that was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Greek and Romans and Yemenis improved the way they teach their pupils. And um, we've got an example of that with someone called Prezolorus, who had um, a, a drama book called The Eritematta, um, made of questions. So, um, how many conjugations do you know? And then people would reply, hang hey, on. The printing Greek was due to um, these um, colleges' activities as students and teachers needed texts. The first book to be printed has been um, have been a grammar book, as I told you, just because they did not require any editing process. That was the easy thing to do to make. The most famous printer for Greek books during the Renaissance is Aldous Maniotis. He made so beautiful copies that they have been kept and survived even the Counter Reformation. Erasmus wrote about him that, um, contrary to a prince who would build a library within walls, Aldous was building a library with no limit but the globe itself. An interesting fact is that Aldous created what he called the Academy, Academia, formed of lecturers, correctors, sorry, proofreaders, uh, teachers, 
um, priests and doctors. We still have the rules applying in this new academia. Uh, so only Greek can be spoken, only learned people are accepted, and if someone speaks something else uh, than Greek, you have to pay a fee. <laughs> So this print and the academia are also engaging because it produced a first lecture consisting of an analysis of Demosthenes and justifying the role of Greek language and literature. <clears throat> so it is necessary to know um, Greek because many subjects derive from it, such as mathematics, all that low text contains uh, many Greek ones in them. And similarly, religious texts emanate from Greek, so one needed to know the language to fully understand them. Now, I'll go on to the second part of my presentation. Um, I'm dealing uh, with Demosthenes, and um, I want to know why he was a model during the Renaissance, and why would people print or study his books. So to understand this, we also have to refer to ancient times, because it seems but the way humanists tackled Greek was echoing the way the Roman would have done it. So there's a sort of um, legacy of practices. The social habits linked um, to textual materials uh, rings an ancient point bell, if you can say. Uh, for instance, the epistolary bound between Guarino and his pupils can remind us of Seneca and Lucilius. But likewise, technical problems due to um, transport of documents um, to be reproduced, for instance, Cicero and his friend Atticus, about the same subject, but centuries ago. So it is relevant to see how Romans comprehended the Greek. The consideration of a Greek language by humanists might come from the fact that the ancients made a distinction between the Greeks and the Romans. In fact, we were a bit Sorry, the rehabilitation of Greek by the humanists also um, has through the consideration um, in the speeches and the orations held by, held by ancient Romans. The famous words penned by Horatius in his epistles is a good summary of the situation. Captive Greece took captive her savage conqueror and brought the arts to the rustic Latium. So while Rome was politically and economically in a dominant position, um, Greece was envied by Rome because of its art, literature, um, philosophy, and architecture. Other elements must be taken into account to estimate the Roman point of view of the Greeks and Greek. Um, Greek is not a unique language, and Greece is made of regions with different dialects. Thus, Demosthenes, recognized um, as the greatest Greek orator, is actually recognized as the best because he is the greatest Athenian orator. So um, it's the city that leads, that has like always had the best men of all. So that's what Greek people say, and Athenians won't say, obviously. But that's also what Cicero would say um, in the Archive. So this criterion of belonging is a major point in appreciation. Greek culture and study were alive, but it is also a debated topic. So we know that bilingualism in ancient times, so speaking both Latin and Greek, is uh, proven among orators. Uh, it is even a flow note to master both of them. But there's also a rejection of Greek that seems to be more of a political stance uh, than anything else. But it shows the relationship between orators and the people, as Latin would be the language of the vulgar, and then uh, Greek would be, um, as in opposition, um, the elite language. However, well-known Greek is um, not the world perceived by the Romans, because they do not want to, um, let's say, intermingle their identities and their political regime. So you've got like Tyrannese Greek, and then um, Republic is purely Latin Roman. So all in all, there is a kind of double dealing, consisting of admiring Greece, but not admitting its qualities. And it might have inspired the Renaissance scholars that we study now, um, because of the attitudes uh, conveyed by Latin texts. This aspect seems important that is in a, sorry, as it is an echo to the national consciousness that begins to express itself in the new states of Europe. So humanists quote or refer to ancient references a lot. And I'm not going to enlarge on that, but they do make mistakes. And I think it's a way to 
and let's distinguish themselves from anthropophagus and to extract what they could use again. Um, so this ancient legacy stands for the most Chinese, as well for he has been praised right from the start. Um, it did not begin during the Renaissance, but during ancient times. The Greek and Latin tradition shaped the most in his image to make him a kind of ideal character. Quintilian and Caesar, of course, but the um, Alexandrian tradition as well, with its um, librarian uh, who did punctuation and commentaries on the text, uh, made this. So we also have um, Libanios, who made a drama based on Demosthenes. Uh, he loved him so much that he even gained the unique name of being the second Demosthenes. Uh, but why do people at this time love him so much? So um, we know, thanks to Cicero, that he is a model of actual and in virtue, which is important for rhetoric, uh, because he knows how to adapt himself, which seems to be its main quality um, for Roman orators. It's all about his style. He is uh, renowned for his style and power to such an extent that Longin says that he is striking as lightning. Even if some authors, such as um, Demetrius um, or Polybius, despite his artificial style or Athenocentrism, uh, we kept Demosthenes as an engaged orator gifted with actor skills, and the term used by Demetrius is hypocrite, which uh, literally means in Greek um, being an actor. And that's quite funny, actually, because this stress put on gesture is something underlined by um, the Roman um, writers, but it's never mentioned by Aristotle, for instance. So the Greek didn't mind about it at all, but the Roman did. Um, Erasmus points, points at that um, at that point, points what a humanist could love in Demosthenes, um, and he said it is bound to rhetoric. He wrote that the orator give, give he gives the impression of simplicity, but masters complex technique, and that is how eloquent, eloquent should be he has. The manifestation of his artifice makes one lose confidence in the speaker. I do not see how an eloquence that boasts and shows itself could be effective. So Renaissance dealt with the same notion of authority that existed among ancient authors. Nevertheless, one has to notice that the way Renaissance does um, appreciate Demosthenes is not as nuanced as before. Uh, indeed, when ancient authors think that Demosthenes is the best orator, orator ever, um, they do so stating it because they compare it with, they compare him with other orators, and that's not the case in, in the Renaissance. During the Renaissance, Demosthenes was the best just because he was the only one. <laughs> so, who was Demosthenes? He was born in 384 and died in 322 before Christ. And we know many things about him thanks to the talk who drew a parallel between Cicero and Demosthenes in his parallel life. So, Demosthenes was a Fenian from the team of Pinaia. He is the son of a furniture and weapon maker. His father died when Demosthenes was seven, and he is left to three tutors. Uh, but these three tutors squandered um, his inheritance, and that is supposed to be the reason why the Muslims, um would have decided to become an orator, so he could sue um, and retrieve his goods, and apparently he did win part of the trial and had his uh, goods back. We also know he must have learned rhetoric with the famous Isaiah. Um, we know, thanks to Plutarch, that he was fragile, he had a stammer, so he did not start his career as an orator. Um, instead, he trained himself, he ran, he ran her heels, he declaimed against the noise of the sea. Uh, he even articulated with tongues in his mouth, and he began as a logographer. That is to say that he wrote speeches for private trials. Philip's ambitions will make the most a man of the situation, and he appeared as a figurehead of the resistance against Philip, um, the king of uh, Macedon. His rhetorical fights against other writers, just Aeschines, must be put in perspective in the context of wars, uh, allies, and uh, through leaks and financial costs uh, being involved. The Arpal Skandar tarnished his reputation in 325. He would have stolen parts of the funds, but by 
fugitive treasurer of Alexander, um, who he had suggested, who he had suggested, so I can't, suggested to put in jail. Uh, when Alexander accepted to the throne, Demosthenes went into exile and only returned as a supporter of the opposition acclaimed by Athens, um, gathering Persians, aliens, and barbarian mercenaries. So Athens then had to confront the other cities who had made a deal during the Lamia War with the successor of Alexander, Antipater, and Athens refused to give, us, to give up the opponent. So Demosthenes and Antipater's enemies then flee to a small island uh, near Arbalis, where they, are, uh, they have been caught, and Demosthenes chose to poison himself in the temple. So now about his works. Um, there are probably around 60 speeches attributed to Demosthenes, uh, and we still have around 40 of them, and they're divided into three categories. So we have um, the judiciary speeches, public affairs, and orations concerning uh, Philip. These uh, orations, called the Macedonian orations, are the most printed works by Demosthenes during the Renaissance. There are six of them. The Olympians, three orations, were trying to convince Athens to help um, the city who asked for help after having been attacked by Philip. The Philippics, um, so that is a corpus of speeches, but they have been put together later. Um, they were not pronounced together. The first Philippic is the most in his warning against the threat that is the semi-barbarian King Philip. The second one is a reaction after a letter sent by Philip claiming that Athenians accused him of not respecting um, a deal they would have made, but he said then that he never took this deal. The third one blames Athenians for being passing, passive and tries to convince them to go to war. Then we've got on the peace, that calls for peace with Philip due to the extreme tension, but still harshly criticizing the peace negotiated before, which he, uh, which Demosthenes had defended as well, but um, that was before Philip extend his, extended his conquest. Then we have on the false embassy, and it's also about this previous peace. It opposes Demosthenes and Aeschines, um, Demosthenes vilifying Aeschines and the ambassadors to um, have waited too long before concluding peace. He also suggests that Aeschines made a false report that ended up in losing the city. Um, then on the Kersoners is made to help the city of Geophytes and its Athenians column, um, so people living there but being Athenians, uh, to fight field. And we, last but not least, we have on the crown, which is probably the most um, famous oration that we know about the most is, uh, by the most is, sorry. So on the crown is the most abrasive um, oration of the most is, and it's a response to Askinis um, against Tessiphon. So Tessiphon had suggested, the most is was a friend of Tessiphon, and Tessiphon suggested that and most of it should be rewarded because he had um, uh, dug trenches at his own expense to defend the city. So Askenis accused um, Tessifon to have violated the law, and he also uses it to contest Demosthenes' political views and political opinions. So in return, um, Demosthenes replied to Askenis in this on the ground, and he said that he was a traitor to the motherland and also corrupt by Philip and also coming from a very poor family, which was terrible, right? Whereas um, the most of perpetrates um, Athenian values, so that's his defense. What we see, the core of this oration, seems to be that Demosthenes himself, right from the start, set himself as a kind of champion, a defender of freedom and democracy against tyranny and Philip. We can also deduce that his history is done to Askenis as well, because the two of them um, do not only blame one another, the accusation they met who lead both them, who both lead them to death. And lastly, Philip appears as an enemy, but also a valuable strategist um, in these operations. So let's move on to data analysis of Fluffy's long introduction to the most of this. Um, so I worked, into that. I worked with two 
men catalogs, there are many more. But I use the University Short Title Catalog, which is um, a Scottish invention, and the CCFR, the Catalog Collective de France. And I have read around 80 books in archives, um, approximately, because sometimes reference are not complete, so I'm not be sure. And there is around 300 items of Demosthenes um, used to make this data analysis. Um, so that's a rather, let's say, workable panel. <coughs> so if you remarked now on numbers and percentage, and I realize now that it's still in French, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so if you look at the chart, um, at the chart, specific places and printers stand out. So um, almost half of the books are published in France. Then comes the Holy Roman Empire, that would be the German niche region. 20% uh, are split between the Netherlands and also Switzerland. Only 20 books have been printed in England. Um, Paris, Paris, Lyon, Strasbourg, Basel, and Florence are the biggest producers of Demosthenes editions. It's rather normal because they are their works um, read by students and teachers, so um, you would have this kind of printing things, printing books about Demosthenes for students who want to um, read the book, annotate it, um, use it for the teacher. Yeah. Um, many leaflets are actually created for the universities, actually. Um, so that does not mean that students could easily um, have access to the text. There were not many texts, and sometimes it paved the way to very odd, weird, and funny situations. Uh, we've got an example of that with um, Claude Mio, so he was a teacher in Paris, and we have his um, leaflets. In 1527, um, he gave a lecture about Demosthenes, and his students came with the leaflets, and actually the, they'll have the same thing. So the lecture he gave about syntax and, and verbs does not correspond to the text that the students would have. <laughs> Some printers' names appear regularly, sometimes they move due to circumstances, such as um, Pechel, who is a very um, a well-known um, French and then German printer. So he lived in France, and then he moved out of Saint-Barthélemy, which is a um, massacre of protestants in France. Um, printers and bookshops um, keepers are linked, but it is explained by the fact that they would marry. So when, when um, let's say, um, a printer would die, um, his wife would marry with a bookshop keeper. So they would, yeah, they would stay in the same center. Or you would marry the daughter of, of a printer. <laughs> Um, so they formed unions this way, and that explains why we still have the same names through century. Um, and without any surprise, famous Hellenist printers are at the top of this list. So, for instance, we've got the famous uh, Parisian editor called Gilles de Beaumont. So then, formats and bindings tell us a bit about how books were used. There are many um, in Octavo, so, um, in water, so the small um, book like this kind of size. Um, uh, because they're small and they're handy to study. Um, Aldous Manusius is the one who popularized this light pocket format for learned people. Sometimes the exact same text is edited with the same presentation and layout, but in a bigger version. So we've got an example of a Demosthenes um, edition that is an anthology uh, commentated by Wolf who is both a printer and a commentator. And we have the uh, importer, which is quite small. It's this size, and it's not very, it's kind of light. And we've got a, a bigger version with the exact same text, but with enormous and gigantic letters. And it's this size. So I think it's just for like, you have a small edition for studying. And if you really like them tennis and you Lot of us, and for connoisseur, you would have this um, enormous um, sum of texts. Um, binding, so unfortunately, many of the books I have seen did not have their original bindings. Um, the reason is that most of the time, so either you don't have a binding because it was um, books were printed but not bound, 
because that was expensive. So you would buy um, paper for paper and you would then uh, have it soon and then ask someone to make a binding for it. Uh, but sometimes, most of the time, if you have a beautiful binding, then it is stolen later. So in the 18th century or 17th century, um, someone would love binding because it's like guilty or something like that and they would take it away and one of the third reason is that um, sometimes you have collectors book collectors and because they're collectors they've got spe specific armories and armor of, um, shields and so they replaced the, the binding with their own binding and the shield and most of the time it's horrible and it's not nice at all but still they had uh, their book collection thingy uh, but when you found, uh, when you can find an engraved, um, a good binding, such as this one, which is an engraved binding, uh, it tells you a lot about the person who has it. So I don't know if you see what is on on binding. No. Yes. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> yeah, so the representations of virtues. Oh. I'll give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> no, even I can't see anything. So you've got you've got this there, like hope, and Fides there. And so we've got you can't see both arm standing and trying to grasp hands. But this is really expensive. And so it certainly belongs to someone who loved Demosthenes and linked it to the fact that he was virtuous because he was an orator. So they link the virtues, the virtues we know of Roman people, like um, um, faith uh, or strength, to the fact that um, eloquence was adequate to strength, etc. And so they met this binding just for Demosthenes. So he was associated with ancient virtues. Um, and we've got another one, so it's an English one. Wait, um, it shows, um, it's in a book, so this is a place down uh, in the interior, of, in the inside of the book, and it shows, um, so this is supposed to be, this there, is rhetoric. Mm. And this was in a book um, um, used by Nicholas, no, by a student um, who followed Nicholas Carr, um, lectures and he would use Demosthenes in most of his lectures so that's why they put this this kind of illustration of eloquence speaking in it. Um, then about languages so 60% uh, of the texts are written in Latin then 30% are written in Greek so that's a good percentage. Um, the rest is written in vernacular languages, so this includes bilingual editions. We have many translations in French, twice the number than uh, Italian editions, which was surprising because you would think because um, they had Aldous Manutius and so many, so many publishers of um, um, Greek that they would have more Demosthenes or more Greek actually. Um, I only found one edition in German and one in English, so um, there are not a lot of English editions of Demosthenes, but it's not really surprising because in England, um, England did not publish a lot of Greek, uh, not during the Renaissance, uh, but it does not mean that the language was not known at the time, but most of the time when, when English people would, um, wanted to uh, use a Greek text, they would use a translation and they would not translate the text themselves. So it ended up in Italian being translated into English or a French version translated into English, which was obviously not the solution at all. Um, if you look at the chart, so I'm sorry you don't have the chart, but it's supposed to be there. <laughs> 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 So if you look at this beautiful chart, you will notice <laughs> much of the text starts around 1520 and keeps going until 1570. Uh, before 1530 and the creations of royal lecturers in Greek, there were no real editions in this language. Uh, then four texts 
orations are published all the time. And uh, most of the time they couple together. So we've got the Philippics and the Olympians talking about Philip and the Protestant, and we've got on the crown dealing with the same matter. Um, you've got regalia mix of offers, so Demosthenes paired with Roman orator um, Orator Cicero, and also Asclepius. Um, when he is um, connected with Cicero, Demosthenes is always under the title of maxims and sayings, so it proves that they um, exemplify virtues. One has to notice that there is um, no stylistic preference, as the Olympians is an early work, but on the crown is not. Now you will tell me what about the other orations that I mentioned before in this very long list about Philip. Well, I think as they uh, kind of look similar, and as um, some passages in Cassanus and the Philippics, in the full Philippic, um, are exactly the same, they don't change the word. Um, maybe princes or teachers did not consider that it would have been of a kind of pedagogical interest to print something with passages that were the same. Um, these statistics evince a few traits um, about how humanism dealt with Demosthenes. So first of all, it seems they saw him either as someone with his type, his style, or as an orator having a rhetorical persona. Second of all, I talked about translations before. Um, translation seems to be clearly problematic at the time. Um, some thought translation was needed for everyone to understand um, the text. Um, some argued that traductore traductore, so to translate is to betray. Um, and then even if you chose to translate, the question was, um, how would you translate it? Would you translate it literally or not? Um, and would you use Latin or vernacular language? Uh, because let's not forget, as I told you before, that um, new language uh, languages were being created at the time. When it comes to rhetoric, if you um, decide if you decide to um, print into French or into Italian, then it means that you decide that eloquence should be done in your language, and that's clearly uh, kind of a nationalism um, expressing, it, uh, expressing it itself through this um, decision. Um, and then the language freshness, if I may say, is um, the reason why you don't have many English versions, actually, because we have um, some passages of letters by Henry Saville or John Clapham saying that, complaining, let's say, about the fact that it totally changes uh, leaving the species of Greek in the horrible, heavy, and terrible English. And third of all, it is clear that the most of his voice is used in a political way. So if you remember the chart that you did not see, <laughs> you could see peaks <laughs> in 1470 and 15. So they actually match political issues and political editions. So one is the translation of the Olympians in Latin, penned by Cardinal Bessarion, who had the copies uh, he illustrated and signed um, the orations, encouraging Athenians to go to the war, and he was trying there to convince European sovereigns to lead a crusade against the Turks. But as I'm in England, I'm going to choose an English piece. And I'm not going to talk about the sign. Um, I'm going to talk about Thomas Wilson and his English translation of the Olympians and the Philippics. So Thomas Wilson said, every good subject, according to the level of his wit, should compare his time past with the time present. And even when he is Athens or the Athenians, remember England and the Englishmen. So he selected the most in his on purpose. Um, because he could choose Cicero, but he wanted to denounce the enemy as someone foreign and an invader, but Cicero attacks Antony, so that doesn't work. So he chose, um, I think he chose Demosthenes for this reason. Um, thus, Wilson really uh, kind of glorifies Demosthenes as someone very pure and full of qualities, and he totally forgot about the fact that maybe um, he would have stolen any money that doesn't exist anymore. And the clever things uh, with this book is that um, he made a paratext of aphorisms and sayings around the text. 
um, and it kind of uh, asks people to be cautious and to prepare for war, but it doesn't touch the most in this text. And then in the text, he used typography, and typography underlines words in Italic. So um, it just underlines martial terms. So um, like every time there's a mention about the deal, every time there's a mention about an army, uh, these kind of things. And it creates a kind of echo with the commentaries in the module. So each saying is kind of a, has a parallel with the words in Italic. And so it doesn't change the text, but it's it kind of I don't know succeeds in uh, pointing at promoting war um, in quite a subliminal way. Let's say thanks to typography. So I'll give my thank you. Thank you.